Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome live here on Facebook. Welcome live over there on Instagram. Look, we got an ugly fan overhead. We're hot in this office, not like hot babes, like, oh, somebody opened a window, it's hot. So we do have a very ugly fan overhead. We keep talking about a more beautiful fixture in the office, in the studio. We'll see what we do. Anyway, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you guys waving to me on Instagram, and it's so good to be with you here on Facebook as well. I got to tell you, we're going to be talking about the ugly truth about decorating here. I am Donna Hoffman, the interior design advocate, and I stop everything we're doing at our luxury design company every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern so that I can come out here and speak with you lovelies live to take your questions about the topic I'm teaching on and if I'm or teaching about and if I'm teaching about a topic that is a little meaty but soft in terms of you can't ask me a question directly about the topic then I open things up to a more general project question so feel free to type in a project question however I will not take anything that requires that I see a picture to be able to answer you okay but first we're gonna be talking about the ugly truth about decorating and there are a number of them. I'm just going to be skimming the surface here today. We've been having a crazy day here at the studio. Oh, Katie, poor thing. Are you recovered yet? Yeah. Katie said barely. Katie was working on some uh, renderings last week and went to open the file in the clouds. Gone. <gasps> just gone. And despite calling our serving group, our server group, it's been a whole big fat mess. We have to rebuild everything. So there you go. So it's so good to be here with you guys now talking about other ugly truths about decorating, but I guess we can add a truth right there that sometimes the unexpected happens and you have to roll with it. And when all else fails, just reach for the 72% dark chocolate. So what are the ugly truths about decorating? Well, one thing I'll tell you for sure, um, you know, you've heard me say this before, but it bears repeating interior design and decorating is way more costly, way more costly than anybody thinks it should be, wants it to be, or wishes that it was. That's why you always have retailers, you know, searching for, you know, how do I get, or manufacturers, how do I get a lower cost sofa? Well, you can make a lower cost sofa, but how much quality do you rip out to get it to a certain price, price before it becomes something that just won't hold up and nobody wants to sit in and it'll look like crap in a year and a half. I don't know if you're allowed, are you allowed to say the C word like that on, on it'll look like so. bleep on, uh, <laughs> and so I just made the curse word worse because I bleeped to myself. It's going to look terrible in a few years or a year. So costs are something that are hard for everyone to control. And I want to give you some comfort here. I shouldn't say hard to control, hard to digest. But I want to promise you that no matter what budget range you are in, whether you have a big fat budget or a mid-sized budget or a really tight budget or a shoestring budget, I want you to know that everybody at every end of the spectrum at some point or other feels that, oh gosh, this thing isn't, this is an expensive undertaking. Just keep that in mind when you're doing your planning for 2019. Be willing to do less, be willing to chop, chop things up into phases. And certainly if you're house hunting, be willing to maybe buy a little less house or less condo so that you can actually have more in your decorating budget because interior design filling a home filling an apartment it is all way more expensive than anybody wishes it was wants it to be or thinks it should cost but those costs add up furniture is big it's bulky it's heavy it's heavy and complicated to uh, create and it's heavy and complicated to ship and then once you start adding in the little luxuries like maybe hiring a designer or going for that beautiful hand knotted rug that you've been spying or maybe treating yourself to some custom window treatments, by the time you add in those little flourishes, those costs just start going up, up and up. Okay, so one of the you know, ugly truths about decorating is not only that it costs more than you wish it did, but it also is going to take longer than you think it should. It's amazing to me. There's a great workshop that I offer for free. And in that workshop, I ask people, how long do you think it took for this Pinterest room to be completed? You have no idea how many people guess two to three weeks. It's unbelievable. And other people guess four to six weeks. Mm -mm, lovelies. Those 
gorgeous Pinterest rooms that you see and those beautiful house rooms that you see, those take months and months and months done by professional teams as well. So design is a slow boat and she does not like being rushed. And when you try to rush interior decorating, rush design, that's when bad decisions are made or a decision is made today that won't make sense, you know, two years from now, if you're continuing to work on your project in a slower, more phased per, you know, way. So another ugly truth about decorating is it is not a fast train, fast boat kind of process. You have to accept that. Then here's something else that I think a lot of women forget. Wise, talented women, just like you, forget about decorating. And, and um, clients who come to us who have never worked with designers before forget this as well. Interior design requires some flexibility. It does. When you start putting together those beautiful images, your craving images from Pinterest or House or the magazines or fill in the blank, and you get really attached, let's say, to a particular wallpaper. You think, oh, I really want to want this wallpaper for my XYZ room. Well, because of the length of time that it takes to complete a room before it gets onto Pinterest and then before it can be photographed, you know, here on the East Coast, we can't photograph year-round. We have to wait for the spring and summer and leafy green months. My buddies practicing down in Dallas, they can shoot year-round. Well, for East Coast designers, that's not the case. So you could see a Pinterest room that took its photograph over more than a year after it completed. Think about it. You might have worked on, that. the designer might have worked on the room for months and months. The room might have been installed in November, December. Then the designer has to wait till June to shoot it. Or if she can't get into her photographer's calendar, she has to wait till July, August to shoot it. Then it gets put out onto, onto house. It starts gaining some traction or Pinterest. And then you find it, the items in that room, the wallpaper in that room could be over two years old. And there is a thing that happens a lot in the interior design world, the furnishings world. And furnishings means not just furniture. It means anything and every appointment that can go into a home or an apartment. Um, oh, an apartment's a home. Into a home. Well, by the time you see that picture, that beautiful wallpaper could be discontinued. Discos, as they get called in the design industry, discontinues happen all the time. Manufacturers are always looking to freshen up their line, so they get rid of things and bring in some new ideas. So it means that flexibility is important. Don't get so attached to that one wallpaper. Or maybe you won't be able to be attached to that wallpaper, not because it discontinued, but maybe it will push the budget so very much. So what do you do in those cases? Well, be willing to go for the essence of that paper. Maybe you're going to do something that's like it, but not exactly it. Or maybe it's not a wallpaper anymore. Maybe it becomes uh, a set of prints that gets framed and put on the wall that embodies that, I don't know, that oversized black and white leaf wallpaper that you fell in love with on a picture somewhere on Pinterest. Or maybe it becomes a fabric on a pillow. The important thing is not to be so attached to, I have to have that exact light fixture. I have to have that exact chair. What's important is you look at your inspiration images and you ask yourself, am I at least with my substitutions, am I capturing the essence of this space? Am I capturing the essence of these craving photos that I've been you know, aiming toward? And I promise you, it's not just you know, design lovers and women like you that have to do that. Designers have to do that too for the same reasons I just mentioned. Things discontinue and also sometimes from a price point perspective, it just pushes a client budget too much. So we have to find an alternative. I worked with a, a very young, lovely couple a number of years ago and the difficulty in working with them, they were really funny and fun, but the difficulty was that she was very fixed. She'd see an image of something that she saw online and she wanted that exact Thing, that exact lamp. So you are constantly doing these needle in a haystack searches and, um, and everything was always coming up short for her because it wasn't the exact, the exact. Instead, go for the essence. And I promise you, you will get the results that you're after. You will, you will hit the gorgeous finish line in the rooms that you are creating based upon those images that you're gathering but flexibility absolutely is necessary. And the ugly truth in decorating and design is that inflexibility in design and decorating is a kiss of death and it will shut down many a project. Another ugly truth about decorating and design, and by the way, if you want to enter a question, feel free to. 
I will be getting to questions shortly. As long as I don't need to see a picture to be able to answer you, I'm happy to take your question. And as long as your question isn't so basic and general that there is no answer to it, happy to take your question, but I'll explain that in a sec. So what's another ugly truth about decorating that people just don't necessarily recognize when they get excited in their new home or their new design project? Well, it's this. Trend paralysis can really start to overtake women, smart women, creative women, just like you. You become so afraid that what you're looking at is going to be off trend, out of style, as you guys like to ask me. Will this still be in style in five years? Will this still be in style in 10 years? I teach a whole course about trends and how they develop and how they morph over time. And I will tell you, trends are confounding and industry professionals are going to shows all the time, looking at trends, watching how different trend seeds are taking root and shaping, how certain seeds are quieting down, what the new seeds are that might catch. But what you need to know is that the design greats, the Albert Hadleys of the world and the Bunny Williamses of the world and the, gosh, fill in the blank, the really fine designers that are trendsetters that the Juan Montoyas of the world, these designers do not and did not redecorate their residences every three years, every four years. They put classic bones as much as possible into the fixed finishes. And then around that, they start designing what they love. They're always designing what they love. And they're looking to do a very fresh take on whatever they're working with. But it's got to be colors that you love, not just colors that are trending. It's got to be shapes that you love. But there's a wonderful blogger who I really enjoy. I enjoy reading her. I enjoy following her. But she's very fixated on, hey, this is going to be out of style. Your home's going to be out of style. Hey, don't do this. Hey, you've got to do a white kitchen. I know white kitchens are having a very long trend moment, but eventually something else is going to happen in kitchens. And I don't know exactly what it's going to be. And I see designers are kind of pushing the envelope, searching for it. But just as at one point people were convinced that other styles would never go away. So when this wonderfully talented blogger says, only white kitchens are classic. Well, there was a time when people said, only swags and jabots on window treatments are classic. Do swags and jabots. That's the most classic window treatment there is. Well, they, they actually fell out of favor. Is it a classical look? Was it a classic look? Yeah. And when people were banking on that, you know, Tuscan and country French look, that was classic, right? It had its roots in France and Italy. Well, eventually, even that gave way to something else. So what do wise designers do? What do wise professional designers do in their own residences? We design classically in terms of millwork so that we know we've got good bones in a, in, in a residence. And then from there, the updates happen, but it's not about renovating and ripping it all out every 10 years. Eventually, yeah, there could be renovations. I'm not saying there aren't, but more often than not, pieces start to swap out. Sofa shapes, a new sofa shape gets swapped in. Fabric start to change on a window covering. Maybe the shape of a window covering starts to change. The bedding might change. Um, and so it works back to choices that were made six years or eight years prior, but we're updating with bedding. I just updated my own bedroom with bedding and new window coverings. Huge difference with furnishings that are clean, simple, and still work, but not necessarily of the moment in the trend that I might specify for a client right now. And frankly, long discontinued, couldn't even begin to find that exact look again. So my point is for you is get out of trend paralysis, be aware of the trends, but design beyond them. Design with the long vision. What colors do I love being surrounded by? What shapes do I love being surrounded by? What types of embellishments do I love being surrounded by? Because the ugly truth in design is that Trend paralysis will stop you in their tracks. And furniture manufacturers and bloggers and Instagrammers are showing you what they want you to buy now, what they want you to buy today. Well, you're a wise design consumer. I know you are. Just as you don't throw out your wardrobe every season, you add pieces in. That's what you'll be doing in your homes as well. So try to get over that paralysis of over-analysis of those trends, okay? The last thing I'll tell you before I hop into questions, if you have a question, feel free to send it in. If you're on Instagram, Katie can get it to me and send it in to me here on Facebook. I'm happy to, you know, I can read it myself. 
But the last thing I would tell you that is the ugly truth about decorating is that window coverings are a huge source of anxiety for design lovers. Um, again, that kind of design paralysis starts to set in. And I'll tell you right now, no room, no matter how expensive the furnishings, the rugs, the artwork, no room looks complete until the window coverings are in, unless it's an uber modern minimalist interior in which the windows are intentionally left uncovered. That's a different story. Or even a transitional interior where windows are intentionally left uncovered or untreated. But I'm talking about the majority of other rooms that have bare windows or dated window treatments because there's too much fear in how do I move forward? Wow, what are not, or what do I layer? Do I not layer? I've got uneven windows. I've got specialty windows. Window coverings are, of themselves are their own rabbit trail. So you are totally normal if you are part of that large segment of the population, ugly truth about decorating, finding that window coverings are just confounding. But because they're so important and powerful in a room, because I see such confusion around them, I want to let you know that on February 23rd, which is a Saturday, so I'm making it easy for people to attend, we are doing a deep dive live mini course immersion on this very topic. And there are some amazing supports before and after the live event that are going to be built in as well. Tickets go on sale in two weeks. So I'll be alerting you to that. And um, if you're on our mailing list, you'll automatically get an invitation to it. And if you're not on our mailing list, you're not getting an invitation. So, okay, I guess we have to give people a way to get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. Well, for now, just email us at theinteriordesignadvocate.com if you want to get on our mailing list so that you know when those tickets go on sale. Um, we are going to cap attendance. We've got, we've got amazing things planned. It's a two and a half hour deep dive into window coverings and you will walk out of there a window treatment boss. You will know what you're doing, whether it's ready-made, semi-custom or custom. And I'll tell you more about it um, in the coming weeks during our Facebook Lives. Okay, so tickets go on sale on the 13th. I believe, and also um, we're going to be um, doing the event, not also, we are doing the event on Feb 23rd, Saturday, from noon to 1, from, excuse me, wrong, it's totally wrong, Saturday the 23rd from 1 p.m. to 3.30, so even my East Coast lovelies and mid-country mid lovelies can easily attend as well. Okay, so we've got questions coming in about the window course. Okay, so I'll answer, I'll answer whatever I can answer. So Susan Benner is saying, hi, Donna, from Louisville, Kentucky. I've never been to Louisville, and I hear it's beautiful. I'd love to get down there. So Susan, if I do, to do a little coffee or something. Um, rugs bought, looking forward to window treatment seminar as a, as the next step. Well, I'm telling you, you're going to love it. It's a two and a half hour dive together, but we will take a break midway. So if you have to powder your nose, AKA hit the restroom, got you covered. And um, you're going to walk away with an actual plan, Susan and everyone for a room before you show up to the event live. There is a pop-up Facebook group I'll be starting that will tell you what you need to do to prepare. It's very simple, but what you need to bring with you and think about so that you are actually working through a plan together with me. So I got you covered there, Susan. Sandra is saying hello from Lutherville, Maryland. Hi there, Sandra. Dina Carroll is saying hi, just joined. Good. Susan is saying ahead of your seminar, is there a list somewhere on the site that contains a list of places to order semi-custom window coverings? No, but we are going, going to be including for our attendees of this live um, mini course, a really extensive resource directory of not only retail, but semi-custom um, and custom options. It's a big list and it will tell you based upon what you're looking for price point wise and what types of custom or semi-custom window coverings they do well. So Stacy, you didn't miss anything. We're just getting started here. So I'm glad you're here. Lori's saying, I have only plantation shutters. I don't like draperies. Well, we'll be talking about plantation shutters, so I'm glad you're not alone. Some people hate draperies. Some people love valances. Some people hate shades. We're going to go through it all, and you will come out smelling like a window rose, window boss, when it's all over. Um, Becky, Lori's saying that you, you struggle with bedding. You know, um, the fact that you're saying that, Lori, that you struggle with bedding tells me that there is something off in your thinking about um, color and 
color pattern fabric. And once you nail that, bedding is just like, it's like as easy as breathing and blinking. So I think there's something missing in your, um, in your design strategy warehouse. Okay. So, um, hopefully we, we can help you with that or you can, you know, find some support somewhere to help you with that. Becky Andrews saying, yay. I was just going to ask if there was a resource for rules for window coverings. Okay, good. Um, Darlene is saying, I struggle not to stay on trend, but just the opposite. I still love beige monochromatic colors and French country and some Tuscan elements. So how do I still do what I love without feeling outdated? Let me tell you something, Darlene. I was just looking at a great Instagram site today, and um, uh, it's Deborah Von Dunup, and she was kind of calling out different styles of things that she liked. Really pretty site. I highly recommend it. And we call, Stephen and I call her DVD. But anyway, um, look her up on Instagram. And um, she was showing something really pretty that was French, French provincial and elegant and sweet and crisp and current. If that is a style that you love, hey, France is still happening. And if you go into certain areas in France, in the provinces, you will still see something that harkens more toward that. Of course, in Paris, you'll see, you know, very modern design being pushed. So if you love, look, guys, if you love traditional, just because traditional is not heavily trending, it's more transitional. Kitty and I are working with a client now. He is really eclectic. He goes from modern into transitional to traditional to rustic. She is traditional into transitional, but she could go super traditional. And if that's where this client wants us to go, this couple, that's where we take them. So my, my answer to you, Darlene, is that I want you to do what you love and you will stay current by virtue of the shapes that you are putting in by way of furniture. So for example, a traditional, um, a traditional living room done in the 1990s or the 1980s would have some slightly different furniture shapes. It's the appointments. I started to talk about this on a Facebook Live, I think last week or the week before. It's the appointments that are delivering that color, that fabric, that start to morph through all the trend cycles. So you can still find a lot of traditional out there. And listen, you know, a gorgeous Persian rug, you could throw super modern a kidney sofa on there or really modern leather sofa on there and have a great look. Or you could throw traditional furnishings on it. Technically, yeah, Persian rug is a, is a traditional element. So Darlene, it's the, the, the sum total of everything that you're putting together that will give you that final look. Don't be bullied by the trends. I want you to do what you love. Here's the time you should be bullied by trends. If you are preparing a residence for sale, then I would say get a little trendy so that every buyer that walks into your home can see themselves living in it and they don't have to try to, you know, connect some dots for themselves. But if you're planning to stay in your residence for a long time, Design what you love, do it tastefully, do great strategy, but you can do a gajillion different styles, I'm telling you, and it can have staying power depending upon how you render it. Hope that, hope that makes sense to you, Darlene. If you have a follow-up question, send it in. Becky is saying, I have four tall windows side by side in my living room. I just have two sheer curtains on the outside too, on two short bras. Is there a rule? We'll be talking about this in that mini course. I really need pictures to be able to teach this well, um, Becky. So what Becky's talking about, I'm gonna do my best to give you a quick answer now, Becky. What Becky's talking about, everybody, is when you don't take a rod across a window, but when you do these partial rods. I've done those, Becky, when I have to, either for budget or because of how many panels a project budget can, can handle. Or if there's no room for the stack, meaning where the other panel would sit on both sides of a window. So you do what you're calling an asymmetrical hang, right? You've got just these, um, wait, actually, are you asymmetrical? I know you've got, I just have two shirt yeah, outside two windows. So out, so here's your window. Instead of panel, panel, it's panel, panel, right? Two outside. So that's called an asymmetrical hang. You can do that. Um, when the rod does not go across the entire window, and again, I have done it, and of course I see it done, just be careful, Becky, because it can really chop up a room, it can chop up a space. Um, so I would ask you, the next time you design something like that, do you want to take the rod all the way across the window, but don't let the rod on the unpaneled side 
project beyond that casement more than maybe an inch or two before you get to that finial, right? The finial is the end point. And then you just let your panel hang on the other side where the rod did extend further beyond the window. So that's another alternative that doesn't break the space in the same way that those little partial um, rods do. I, I have very mixed feelings about those partial rods. And again, I've done them um, in rooms when, when so required. So I hope I answered you there. And that's easy. Again, it's easier to teach when I've got the, something like that, when I've got visuals in front of me. But great question. Becky's also asking, <laughs> sorry, my phone spazzed out. Is there a, a rule for how long to make the curtain rods? Well, generally speaking, oh, okay. So you're not doing those little chopped up rods. Whew. Oh, I got a whole other lesson out of there. Uh, the rule is, you know, the safe rule, uh, two to four inch, you know, four inches beyond the window on either side. Meh, kind of Dullsville as far as I'm concerned. So I try to push that proportion and I'll go six, seven, sometimes eight inches beyond. It depends upon how big the window is itself. Um, and chances are the terminology that you guys are using when you refer to my window, as I'll be teaching in that the mini course, the terminology you're using and the way you're looking at your window, your window may be different than the window you think it is, even though it's just a rectangle or a square. That's all I'll say. But anyway, the, the, the um, common rule, Becky, is four inches, at least four inches beyond the casement on either side of your window. The casement is that um, the, the, the trim. All right, final two questions. I'm getting Katie telling me final two questions. I think I got through all the questions, actually, Miss Katie. So last call for questions. While I'm giving you an opportunity to get last questions in, I will tell you that next week, if this week we talked about the hidden, the ugly truth, the ugly truth about decorating, next week we're talking about the hidden truth about window treatment design. Hmm. <laughs> Pretty timely. Okay, so next week is the hidden truth about window treatment design. I hope you'll join us here 4 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Next week, week we're going to be tackling some of the window treatment uh, bugaboos that, that people get through and get into. In the meantime, I'd love to ask you, give us a follow. Um, if you don't already follow us on Instagram, I hope you will. You can find us at decorating.genius. And if you're already following us on Instagram, I hope you'll check us out on some of our other uh, social media. We've got a great YouTube channel. We are uh, on Facebook, Instagrammers. If you spend any time on Facebook, you can find us there as well. On YouTube, you'll find us as the Interior Design Advocate. We do T to Peep questions of the week to answer questions that are sent to us. So if we need some visuals, we can do those for you as well. So I don't see any other questions coming in. Katie, anything else coming in? Katie's got a question. We dip, 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 dip. Hold on. There's a question coming. Well, while Katie's giving us that question, I'm just going to do this. Ah, good. All righty, Katie, here we go. All righty. Is it safe, is it safe to restain a leather couch? Restain a leather couch. You mean re -dye it? Is that what you're asking me? Um, is it safe in terms of off-gassing, do you mean, from the harshness of the chemicals? Um, or is it possible to do? Um, I would have to actually do a little research on that and get back to you. you somebody finally asked me a question that stymied me. Um, I have never in my life seen anyone recolor, re-dye the fabric of a sofa. I have seen people try to restore sofas by way of, um, you know, stain removal or if there's some seams opening up, that sort of thing. But usually a fabric or leather is just so beyond um, help or the color is just so off. Usually we just reupholster it or replace it. So I, I honestly don't know. Have you ever heard of anybody recoloring a leather Redying it. I know that I know the question was asked is restain. Usually stain is something that's applied to um, uh, like a piece of wood, you know, soaks into the into the wood. It's a stain. So have you ever heard of that, Katie? No. No. Nope. Katie stumped oh, also. So now look at this. Poor poor Katie's aggravated. She <laughs> lost files. Oh, she's still still mumbling. I don't know if you can hear. She's mumbling. <laughs> I love Katie to pieces. And now she's now she's been stymied as well about re, re, the question of restaining a leather sofa. Never heard of that before. So I think you mean re dye. I think honestly, this will it will be worth it'll be way more trouble than it is worth. Um, very often a reupholstery um, is the same cost as a replacement. 
um, unless you're dealing with something to the trade goods, really top shelf frames that like a Kravitz sofa, we're working with a client, it was actually lower cost to reupholster in a beautiful fabric than to replace it new with a like Kravitz sofa. So if you're dealing with that type of product, that's when a reupholster is worth it. Okay, another question? No, no more questions. Okay, there are no more questions or no more questions here. All right there, my lovelies. It was great to be here with you. I will see you next Tuesday, 4 p.m. Eastern. We'll be talking about the hidden truth, the difficulties involved in window treatments, and I'll be telling you even more about the live mini course deep dive that we are doing on February the 23rd. So I will see you then. In the meantime, hugs and kisses to everybody, and I'll see you next week.